Good morning. Good to be back up here this morning. Uh, I know there's a meal, and I go a long time. I just, I can't help myself. So if, if, if you, I think it's quite a, kind of fitting, actually. I was thinking about this before I walked up here. You know, you're going to have to resist the hunger, okay? You're going to have to resist it. But if you do have to leave early for the, whatever you need to do, feel free. It won't hurt my feelings. A lot of you know that I am a Nebraska Cornhusker fan. Uh, yeah. I did. I know. I, I think in, in speech class, you're supposed to know your audience. I'm just not very good at doing that. But I, did, I was not raised in Nebraska. I think my family left there when I was three. But I was born there, and that's all you need to become one of those annoying Nebraska fans. In, uh, in 1994, speaking of football, that is, in 1994, the, the Nebraska Cornhuskers, their offensive line, they were so good, they were so dominant, they had a nickname. Anyone know what that nickname was? The Pipeline. The pipeline. They were called the Pipeline. Now, I don't know that they've had the Pipeline there since early 2000s, but man, you know, and I'm one of those annoying Nebraska fans. I, I, I'll admit, I live in the past. <laughs> I live there. I long to return there. But here's the thing. They were so good. They were so good. They tell this story. They tell this story where they would line up against a defense. They'd run a play. And it would get good yardage, right? It would be successful. And they would line up a second time and they would talk to the defense. And they tell this story where they talk to the defense and they say, hey, hey, we're going to run the exact same play again. Just try and stop us. <laughs> and no one could. No one could. No one could stop them. And now, I don't know about you, but if you're a quarterback, a running back, a halfback, anybody behind your, that kind of offensive line, with a line like that, like, would you not have the utmost trust and confidence that no defensive attack is going to get through? None whatsoever. Now, I know this is probably an awful example, and it, and it pales in comparison to the confidence and trust we can have in God that he will protect us from the schemes of the devil. He will protect us through his might, through his strength, through his power against the spiritual forces of evil from temptation, from trials to get us through. And so today we'll be talking about that, that trust and confidence we can have in God and, and his word as we continue this series on the whole armor of God. And so we're in Ephesians 6, and the whole armor of God, verses 10 through 20. We're commanded to put on the whole armor of God so that we can stand against the schemes of the devil. And the devil schemes against us, right? These are temptations to sin. There, there are trials in our life that the devil uses to try and interrupt our walk with God, interrupt our, our relationship with God. And he does so through, through other means, through rulers and through authorities and through cosmic powers and spiritual forces of evil. And yet God does not leave us alone, right? He's, he says, look, I'm giving you my power I'm giving you my strength. Put, just put on the armor and you'll have it. Anyone know the situation going on with Steve Lawson? Anyone hear of Steve Lawson? He's a prominent pastor. He's actually quite popular. Uh, I don't know that he's written very many books uh, he sat on several panels with famous pastors like John MacArthur and stuff like that. But Steve Lawson recently was disqualified from ministry due to an inappropriate relationship with a woman. And the only reason that I say that this morning is because I want to make it clear 
that everyone, everyone, no one, let me put it this way, no one is exempt from temptation. And no one is exempt from needing God's armor. No one, not even the most popular pastors, not even the most popular musicians. We all need to put on God's armor. And I pray, I pray also that your faith is grounded in God and not in some musician or, or, or faith leader. The last time I covered the first three pieces of armor, Ephesians 6, starting at verse 14, it says, Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and his shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. We need to be first committed to the truth, committed to telling the truth, being in the truth, living it out, so that, so that we don't get trapped by the devil's lies, so that we don't live a lie. We need to live righteously or live rightly according to how God wants us to live so that the devil can't get a foothold in our lives. And we need to be ready for the temptations to come. We need to be ready to share the gospel. And in Ephesians 6, as we go on through the armor, the last three pieces of armor, Ephesians 6, verses 16 through 17, it says... In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So right away, Paul is in all circumstances, take up. That is whenever you are being tempted to sin, in all circumstances that would possibly lead you to sin, take up these pieces of armor. When your trials come that, that would possibly lead you into sinning, take up these pieces of armor. So Paul says, take up the shield of faith. Now shields at this time, they came in all varieties of sizes. Gladiators tended to use smaller ones so that they could move around quickly. But the word here that he uses for shield is a Roman shield. This is a shield that looked like a full door. It was oblong, it was heavy, it was large enough to fit your whole body behind. And it provided full protection from attack. It was, they would cover it in leather. They would actually soak it in water so that it would, it would uh, keep from, from lighting on fire. Because at this time, one of the most devastating weapons on the battlefield were arrows, were the darts, right? Imagine being on a battlefield and hundreds, if not thousands of sharp, pointy objects <laughs> are just flooded your way. I mean, how terrifying would that be? Like, if you really think about it. And if you think about it, not only were they just you know, arrows flying through the air at you, they would dip them in pitch and light them on fire and hurl at them at you, thousands of them coming your way. And so the flaming darts on the battlefield were devastating unless you had a shield that could repel the attack. And so when Paul talks about these flaming darts, these flaming arrows, what he's referring to is these are the the schemes of the devil. They are the devastating temptations that we deal with on a daily basis that could possibly interrupt our walk with God. And, and you know, temptations come at any moment. Any moment. We don't know when they're going to come. They come in the heat of a moment without warning, and we need to be ready. We need to be ready to face them. There are temptations of the flesh, of the eyes, of boastful pride, of envy, greed, temptation to doubt God, to slander, to hate, and on and on, right? You name it. You could think of any sin you want to. There's temptation to do it. 
Some of us might have one temptation while another person has a different temptation, but all of us deal with it. But here's the thing. We should not be surprised when the temptation comes. Even, even Peter says, 1 Peter 4, 12 through 13, he says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. And you get the same imagery from Peter as you do Paul, right? The, the flaming darts, the temptations to sin, and the fiery trials that Peter says. Like, we're not supposed to be surprised. We know they're coming. Have you ever watched a television show where there's a couple who have an affair, right? And then, and then they clip to the next scene, and it's the next morning, and they wake up, and they go, what happened? That drives me nuts. Oh, I don't, I don't even know what just took place. I, did, I had no control over my lustful desires whatsoever. And the world acts like it's a baffling mystery that these things happen. As if we have no control over it. As if we haven't been given power to defeat it. We should not be surprised when temptation comes. We're supposed to know exactly what to do because we're ready, ready to take up the shield of faith in all circumstances. See, the devil wants us to doubt God, right? And in doubting God, that's when, that's when we, we, we turn away from God and we look for something else to fulfill our lives, right? And it's, it's sinful to turn away from God, period, and we deal with it on a daily basis. So Paul says we need to protect ourselves from these devastating attacks by putting faith in God. And in fact, when you read through the Bible, the Bible describes God as our shield. You read it all over the place, especially in Psalm. In the book of Psalm, it's everywhere. Proverbs 30 verse 5 says, Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Psalm 91.4 says, He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. Psalm 28.7, The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts and I am helped. My heart exults and with my song I give thanks to him. Or there's verses in the New Testament which allude to God being a shield. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians Chapter 3, verse 3, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. So only God's armor can protect us completely from these devastating temptations. And like a Roman soldier's shield, only faith in God can fully protect his believers. What does faith mean, though? There's now, a lot of you know, I've, I've said this many times, I like to watch debates, and I like to listen to debates on, between Christians and atheists, and a lot of times the atheists will get stuck on trying to define faith. And a lot of times what they say is, faith is blindness. It's a blind belief. And that's not how the Bible describes faith. It's not what the Greek term means. The term is trust. It's confidence. But how do you get trust and confidence? You get that by seeing that God is faithful, that he's the one who actually fulfills his promises. And when you look through the Old Testament and all the stories in the Old Testament, you know, God, um, he, he'll set a covenant up or make a promise to uh, the Israelites or, or a specific person. And that person does what? They fail. Who never fails on the covenant? God time and time again. And so faith is trust. It's having confidence in God that he's the one who fulfills promises. And it's actually when we stop trusting in God that we turn to sin. And a really good story from the Old Testament, that is Abraham and Sarah. And you can find this in Genesis, starting in Genesis 12, right? God comes to Abraham with a promise. Hey, I'm going to make you a great nation, and, and there's some events that happen in between there. God promises, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send the Messiah through your family. And of course, at this time, Abraham and Sarah, they're old already. 
They're barren. And some time goes on, and Abraham comes back to God and goes, I don't, how, I don't know how you're going to do this. I don't get this. We're barren. I have no children. I don't think you're going to fulfill this promise. In fact, in fact, I have no heir, and I'm going to have to give all that I have over to just some person in the household. And God comes back to him and sa- tells him again, no, I'm going to give you your very own son. You're going to have offspring that would be more numerous than the stars. And once again, Sarah and Abraham, they misplace their trust. They're like, I just don't see how God's going to make this happen. I need to take control of this situation. So Sarah's plan is, hey, Abraham, why don't you take my maid here, Hagar, have a child. That way, we'll, we'll for sure make this promise happen for you. Nothing could possibly go wrong with that plan. In fact, Abraham, Abraham could say no. He could say, no, Sarah, we're going to trust God. We're going to stay on that path. We're going to believe what God says. But even he doesn't. And he follows through. And the result of that is you get broken relationship with God and his plan, his plan of salvation. You've get, you get all this sin that causes so many problems, causes Sarah to be jealous and spiteful, resulted in Hagar and Ishmael to be sent away and the trials they would face and so much more. And sin does so much more damage than what you and I could ever possibly think of. The consequences extend so much further beyond just ourselves. And it really annoys me to, that the mantra for today is, hey, just do whatever you want as long as it doesn't hurt anybody. And that's a lie. That's a lie because neither you or I could possibly foresee what the consequences of our sin will be. And it bothers me that no one thinks that no one thinks that hurting ourselves is a bad thing. No one no one thinks that hurting our relationship between God and ourselves is a bad thing and it goes beyond what we can know. But if we could actually wait on God, if we could actually believe God, it would solve a lot of our problems. In fact, you know, if we if we could trust God through the temptations, right? It would take away a lot of sin. It's that simple. I make it hard myself. What does this faith look like, though? What does it look like? How many of you have children that have, like, a food allergy? Yeah, okay, several hands. If you think about this in this way, how many times as a parent, knowing that, let me put it this way. The, your child knows that they have an al- a food allergy. They know the consequences of eating food that they shouldn't eat, right? And some are worse than others. Some could be devastating, but some could be really uncomfortable. Who knows what it is? But think about just all the times that you have put food in front of your child and they don't question it at all. They just eat it. Because they have complete faith and trust in their parents that they're going to give them the right thing, the right food, that it's not going to harm them. And so just like this, we need to trust God in the midst of temptation, believe that God knows what's best for our lives, living the way God wants us to live, not how we want to live. Trust God, wait on God. Not to fulfill our every desire, but to give us what we need. We need to trust that God knows exactly what we need and trust that his way of living is ultimately fulfilling in the end. And again, I want to remind you, this is not some prosperity gospel thing where it's like, okay, if you put on the armor of God, you'll get good things. What we're saying in the context of this is if you put on the armor of God, he's promised to get you through the temptation to sin and through the schemes of the devil. One of my commentaries that I was reading said this. It said, My faith is nothing except for what it puts in front of me. 
and it is God who is truly my shield. My faith is only called a shield because it brings me behind the bosses of the Almighty's buckler against which no man can run a tilt or into which no man can strike his lance nor any devil either. God is a defense and my trust which is nothing in itself is everything because of that with which it brings me into connection. The only reason our faith matters is because it brings us into connection with the Almighty God. Faith is the condition and the only condition of God's power flowing into me and working in me. And when that power flows into me and works in me, then I can laugh at the fiery darts because greater is he that is with us than all they that are with them. So we need to shield ourselves by believing God, trusting God. Paul goes on in verse 17, he says, and take the helmet of salvation. This one seems like a no brainer, right? You need a helmet when you're in battle, one blow to the head and you're done. Abe found this out in football at Williamsburg the past game. He was seeing some stars. And it's a good thing he had a helmet on. It's an extremely important piece of armor. And Paul is saying here that we need to protect our minds. We need protection from doubting God and his plan. But what does this mean, helmet of salvation? What does Paul mean to put on the helmet of salvation? Does that mean we need to, what does that mean? Does that mean we need to get resaved every day? Like, it, I mean, if we get through the temptation without sinning, but he's saying put on the helmet of salvation, are we just like in this constant flux of, of, of unsaved and needing to be resaved and unsaved and needing to be resaved? Is that what Paul is saying? Because we're promised that Jesus won't lose any of his followers. We're promised salvation through Christ. But here's the thing you need to understand. The Bible talks about three phases of salvation. Three phases. You've got past, present, future salvation. The first piece of salvation that a believer comes to. This is when the moment you come to the saving knowledge of Christ and put your faith in Christ, we are saved from our sins. And this is, this is called justification, right? We are, when we put our faith in Christ, we are justified from our sins, from our past sins. This is called past salvation, okay? This is the first phase of any believer. The second phase is you're presently being saved. You're presently being saved. And what that is called is sanctification. Your present salvation, that is, we are continuously growing as Christians. We continuously wanna move closer and closer to Christ, closer and cro closer to being more Christ-like every day, every moment, and further and further away of who we used to be, the sinful lifestyle that we had, further away. The third phase of salvation for a believer is what's called glorification. This is your future salvation. This is that there is a future hope and glory waiting for us. A promised hope of being with God in heaven. As it says in Revelation, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. It's a future hope and glory. And so the salvation that Paul is actually talking about here in this chapter is future salvation, our future hope and glory. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8, he says this, But since we belong to the day... Let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Here's the thing, if you think about this, if there is no future hope, 
right? If there is no future life beyond the grave, if there's no future promise to being with God, whatever you do in this life doesn't matter. It would not ultimately matter. In fact, that's what Paul says too, right? If, if, if Christ did not raise from the dead, if there is no resurrection from the dead, right? You might as well do whatever you want. If there's no future hope to focus on, then it wouldn't matter how you live. But the thing is that there is a future hope. We're, we're promised that. And so here's the point on this, on the helmet of salvation. By focusing on our future salvation, what it does is it's, it's the goal, right? It's the prize. And when we focus on that, when the temptation comes to sin, we go, hold on a second. What's the goal? And we need to look towards our future salvation and say, no, no, I want that. I want that. I don't want that sin. I want the future hope of salvation. And so we keep our minds focused on that future hope to help us op overcome the schemes of the devil. So we need faith. We need to believe God. We need to keep our minds set on the hope of salvation to get us through. Paul goes on to say we need to take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Why the sword of the Spirit? It's the sword of the Spirit because we are in spiritual warfare. It's a spiritual battle. And this is interesting that God gives us one weapon. And it's the only one we need, the most powerful weapon, the very word of God. I find it interesting that when Paul uses the word sword here, it is a specific word that is a, actually a short sword or dagger. It's not like a broad sword. It's not these three foot, four foot long swords. It's short. It's actually the same word when Peter cuts off the ear of Malchus. And I think it's interesting that God would use such, what the world would probably view as such a lowly weapon to say that this is ultimately the most powerful weapon in the world. So Paul here is saying the word of God is a spiritual sword, a spiritual weapon given by the Holy Spirit. It has many uses, but in this case is used to fight against the schemes of the devil or the temptations, the devastating temptations. The Bible actually has a lot to say about itself. When you read through the Bible, you can learn a lot about the Bible, believe it or not. A few things that it says. It says it is truth. John 17, 17, Jesus says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Hebrew, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and of spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It is power. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. It is the word of life. Jesus says in John 5.24, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. And in that same book in John, the Gospel of John, right, he identifies Jesus as the very Word of God. The Bible is the most influential book in human history. As one, one article I was reading put it this way, the Bible has influenced every area of human culture, including government, education, literature, music, law, art, history, and religion. And literally, we would be just stuck in darkness without the Bible. We actually, if you look at it historically, we wouldn't probably know how to read. 
We wouldn't know how to communicate. The Bible is powerful, but we need to know how to use scripture. We need to know how to use it. I think I've said this here before. Memorizing scripture is good, but it doesn't really mean a whole lot unless we understand the scripture that we're reading. We need to understand it. When Paul here says, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, that word, the word, word, (laughs) you with me? The word, word there, it's not the typical Greek word logos. This word here is rhema. It means a spoken word. It is a specific statement. And what this means here is we need to know specific scripture and how to apply it to our situations in life. You need to know specific scripture, how to apply it appropriately, how to use the word of God correctly. Because I'll tell you this, the devil knows the Bible. The devil knows scripture. In fact, he knows it so well that he loves to use it against Christians to try and twist scripture. And so we need to know it. We need to be like the Bereans, When Paul goes to Berea, Acts chapter 17, it says, now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. How many of you are like me? When I go to sit down to read scripture, I don't get very far. And it, and it actually gets frustrating, right? I get a little panicky. I don't get very far because I'm like, I want to understand what I'm reading. And so I, I, I have to stop and spend time looking up what it means. But yet in the back of my head, I'm like, I got to get through this in a year. But that's not true. We don't really need to get through it in a year. We just kind of put that on ourselves. We need to understand it. We need to dig deep into scripture. I want to talk a little bit about how to read scripture. And I want to give you a few tools in order to do that. Number one, when when I was reading Acts 17 verse 11, talking about the Bereans, it says that they received the word with all eagerness. We need to be eager to read. We've got to want to read the Bible, right? We need to spend time reading it, digging into it. It also says that they examine the scriptures daily. We need to examine scripture. How do we examine scripture correctly? I was blessed at going to Heston College. I was blessed to take a class, biblical literature there. That was one of the most helpful classes I've ever taken. We did, we did what they call inductive Bible studies. And so we're going to spend the next two hours learning about <laughs> inductive Bible studies. No, I won't take you through that. But, but it, was, it was so valuable learning how to do that and how to understand Scripture. So let me give you a tool. And, and I think is Ashley... Oh, I, Ashley, in some of her uh, women Bible studies, I think she's gone through some stuff, not the exact tool that I'm going to use, But some of this stuff, so maybe this might be uh, duplicating some of this here. But I I think it's so important to have some sort of tool. And so what I want to give you is this acronym. I get this from the book Stealing from God. It's a Frank Turk book. And it's STOP, right? So when you're reading scripture and you don't understand it, stop. Stop. So here's, here's what it is. Let me go through this quick. The first S is situation. Okay, what is the situation? What is the historical situation? What do you need to know about the people and events in history? What's the larger context? In other words, what's the historical context? Right? It's so hard to understand what they're talking about in Scripture unless you know what the historical context is. So S, what's the situation? What's the historical situation? T is type. What's the type of literature? There's a lot of questions here. Is it historical narrative? Is it poetry? 
Is it prophecy? Is it law? Is it wisdom? Is it an epistle? What literary devices are being used? Hyperbole? A parable? Metaphor? Apocalyptic imagery? Like what's going on? For example, when the Bible says, when Jesus says, I'm the door, are we supposed to take that literal that Jesus is a door? Right? No. So, I mean, that's an odd example, probably an easy one, right? But it's so much deeper than that. That's a metaphor. And so we get to dig deeper into that and discover what that actually means. So we need to know the type of literature. We also need to know the object. Who is the object of the text? Is it everyone? Is it specific people? Is it ancient Israel? Is it old or new covenant? How many of you know Jeremiah 29, 11? Can you recite it? Yeah. Good, I've heard it several times. Let me tell you. It says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Now, here's the thing. I don't, I don't want to ruin this for any of you. <laughs> and it's okay. If you want to use that verse, use it. God does know the plans he has for us. That's true. Who's the object, though, in this passage, in this particular passage? Do you know who's it for? Let me give you a little context of this. This, this verse is, is surrounded by the, the object of ancient Israel. What's going on in the time is that there are some Israelites in captivity. There are some Israelites that are still in Israel. And right before this verse, God is telling those that are still in captivity, he's saying, hey, I'm leaving you in captivity for another 70 years. And then he says this, for I know the plans I have for you, plans for welfare and not for evil to give you a future hope. He was planning after another 70 years of sending them back to Israel. And then right after this, right after this, he talks about those who remain in Israel. And he says this about those people those Israelites who remained in Israel. He says, thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, I'm sending on them the sword, famine, and pestilence, and I will make them like vile figs that are so rotten they cannot be eaten. Yet no one picks that as their life verse. <laughs> I don't mean to ruin the verse for you. It is true that God knows the plans, but it's not necessarily true that for us, He's going to prosper us. It's important to know who the object is. Prescription is the P, prescription. Is this passage prescriptive for us today or merely descriptive of a historical event? There's a lot of times in the Bible where it's just describing a historical event. But then there are other times that it is actually prescribing for us to do something, to live a certain way. So it's important to recognize the difference between the two. So that's stop. That is stop. Situation, type, object, is it a prescription? There are so many of these acronyms that you can use that are floating out there. Maybe some better than others. I just thought that this would be helpful for you. What we should also do is correlate scripture. Have you guys ever seen this? This is pretty cool. We, we, we should be cross-referencing scripture. If you, don't, if you don't understand scripture in one place, it might be helpful because in your Bibles, you have cross-referenced scriptures usually in your columns, in most Bibles. Right? And what that means is you can go to those other passages that it lists and read about similar things, similar events, uh, uh, similar references to people, places, and it might help you understand what is going on. 
Now what this depicts is what they did here was there are a little over 63,000 cross-reference scriptures in the Bible, which is amazing. There's no other book like that, and especially from the time that it was made. But all these lines on the bottom, on the horizontal line, represent all the 63-some thousand verses. And all of the arcs, the colored arcs, are the links to those cross-reference verses. And it just, it just paints a kind of a beautiful picture of, of what the Bible is full of, of, of those cross-references. I don't know, it's kind of cool. So we need to be cross-referencing scripture. We should also pray on it. We need to spend time praying about scripture. That we would know the truth, that we would know God's will, and that we would understand it fully. I think one of the best examples, though, that we can get from, from this verse, from, from the Bible, on, on using Scripture effectively is Jesus, right? Number one source. Jesus, in, in Matthew 4, if you want to look there, in Matthew 4, Matthew 4 is when Jesus is tempted by the devil. And this is what we're talking about, being tempted by the devil. And Jesus is in the wilderness. He's been there for 40 days. And this is a reflection of Israel's time in the wilderness in, in, in the book of Exodus. They're in the wilderness for 40 years. And Jesus goes out into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. And he's hungry. And if you think about the times that when you're vulnerable to sin, a lot of times I think we're physically tired we're deprived of physical needs. For a lot of us, it's when we're hangry. That is hungry, which makes you angry. Or maybe we're bored. And Jesus has been in there for 40 days and 40 nights. And humanly speaking, he is probably at his physical breaking point. And the devil, the devil's plan is, hey, I want to mess up God's plan, his redemptive plan. Because if the sinless savior isn't sinless, then he can't be a savior. And so here we have Jesus coming out of the wilderness and being tempted by the devil. And the devil says to him, he says, if you're the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread, right? You're hungry. You haven't eaten. Just make these loaves of bread turn, or rocks turn into loaves of bread. And Jesus does what? He quotes scripture. And every time in this section when he quotes scripture, he quotes from Exodus. And so Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so the devil then goes, oh, I see what game we're playing. Hey, I can quote scripture too. He goes, okay, the devil took him to the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, which on one corner of the temple, there's a 300 foot drop. And he says this, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written. And so the devil quotes Psalm 91. He says, he will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands, they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Look, if Jesus were to, he's saying, if you're to do this, Jesus, if you're to jump off this cliff, the angel, it, the scripture says right there in Psalm 91, that you'll be saved. Send his angels. Your foot won't strike the stone. Well, you won't hit the bottom. And you know, if he was able to do this in front of people, maybe Jesus would have gotten a huge following at that moment. But the funny, I don't know that it's funny, but the devil here blatantly pulls just pieces of scripture out of Psalm 91. Because you want to know what Psalm 91 is all about? It's all about those who are faithful to God get God's protection. 
And those who are not faithful to God do not get God's protection. So Jesus says to him again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And the devil then takes him to a very high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms and said, here, I can give you a shortcut to your kingdom. You want a kingdom? Here it is. You don't have to go through God's redemptive plan. You can just simply kneel to me. So he quotes scripture again. He says, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And every single time Jesus uses the word of God, he uses it correctly. He uses it effectively. He knows, he knows, you better believe Jesus knows Psalm 91 and the devil was just pulling things out of context. And then it says the devil left him and behold, the angels came and ministered to him because Jesus was faithful to the follower, which is what Psalm 91 is all about. The father then sends his angels to minister to him. So just as Jesus uses the very word of God to defeat the schemes of the devil, those, those deadly temptations, we can do this too. God's given us his power to use the word of God, but we need to be in the word. We need to examine the word. We need to know what it means. We need to apply it correctly to our different life situations. And so let me just wrap this up. A quick wrap up here. We need to put on the full armor of God. It says in all circumstances, all of them, all trials, all schemes of the devil, all temptations, we need to put on faith. We need to believe God. We need to trust God. We need to put on the hope of salvation, right? We need to remember what the goal is. The goal is to get to the end, to get to that hope of salvation. And we need to turn to the word of God, using it appropriately to defend the evil schemes, those devastating temptations. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this time to get to learn about who you are. And even though we are tempted in this world to sin on a daily basis, I thank you for giving us your power, your strength through your armor. And I just ask and pray that every one of us would be reminded by your Holy Spirit to on a daily basis and in all circumstances take up the shield of faith that we would believe you. That when we come in contact with the temptation to sin that we would believe you that you will get us through that you are the one who will ultimately fulfill us in our lives. Help us to remember that uh, your plan of salvation, that at the end there's glorification, there's a, there's a future promise, and to keep that in our minds so that we would turn from sin and move towards the goal. And that we would use your very word to defend ourselves and to attack the schemes of the devil. That we would... That we would have an eagerness to dive into scripture and learn what it means so that we can actually apply it into our lives. And I just ask all these things in your holy name. Amen.